So the topic of my uh, presentation today is research as the art of transformation. That's the overall arching theme of my talk today. And what I want to talk about today, Nancy alluded to, maybe I don't even have to, to give it, Nancy told you, <laughs> many of the things that um, are dear to my heart about the way research can be conducted throughout the human sciences and even humanities, but particularly for those of us who are blessed to be in the field of transpersonal psychology. Because we have a potential, I think, in the field of transpersonal psychology to be genuine leaders when it comes to research methods around the world, actually. And if my, the emails I get, I got an email the other day from India uh, from a molecular biologist saying that she had read Williamson, my first book, and she said, I'm so relieved to find somebody that I can kind of relate my spirituality to what I do in the lab. And she said, you know, I've been so lonely. And this is, these are the kinds of people that we wrote those books for. We wrote them initially for our own students, primarily our doctoral students. And then as time went along, we became increasingly aware that we had a larger audience to address, like this young scientist from um, India, molecular biologist. And uh, it, it has been a great honor. And it, it's been surprising, frankly, that we have been as successful as we have been. I mean, Shocking, actually. I mean, I just, I'm not saying that we're, you know, that we're like world famous or anything like that, but within the field of, of research methods, which is a, a specialized field, we are well known for what we have done. And as one of my colleagues said, well, your books will always be there. I mean, it's, it's, really, an, it's really an honor. And without William Broad, you know, without William Broad, we could not have been able to do this because we did it very much together. It was a synergistic project in and primarily in relationship to our students. And that is the story I, I want to tell you a little bit more about. So the first picture, I love this image for talking about transformation because it's sometimes pretty hot, right? Transformation, change in general, but personal spiritual transformation can be really pretty fiery. It can be really hot, and it can be very engaged. It can make many, have many ramifications in your life uh, over and above, uh, you know, just doing a research project, for example. And the students who I've had the pleasure of working with over these 23 years at, at ITP Sevilla, um, you know, some of them go through some pretty hot and fiery periods. Right, Jackie? Yes. Right. <laughs> and it's just, <laughs> it's just the way it goes. And that does make doing a thesis or a dissertation or, or being in the program in general, the MA and the PhD program, unique in certain ways. Uh, by comparison, my PhD program was a snap, really, compared to what uh, the your opportunities are <laughs> uh, here because you know you, you, the the in, the inter um, weaving of your personal and spiritual growth and life in the program uh, together with your intellectual life is is just much bigger than the way my dissert, my doctoral program was. You know, I went to the University of Nebraska Lincoln. I mean, you know, you did this, and then you did this, and you took this course, and you took it, and you were done. Four years, but you were done. And it, it didn't implicate my personal life, you know. And it was comparatively easier than what you're doing here. <laughs> so you, I know you pay good tuition, but you do also look, you know, you get a lot out of it, too. All right. So I want to say that. So the fiery aspect is symbolized for me by this photo. And what it is, is a, um, a piece of bark, a very thick piece of bark that happened to be, I placed it in the 
to burn, and it burned this nice arch. So it's a kind of bridge, uh, uh, an image that I, I'm, I'm just unusually happy with. I also took this photo, and this is another way of thinking about transformation. This is on the coast uh, of uh, Rhode Island, where my um, maternal uh, parents are, are from, my mother's and her um, mother and father. And for many years, my brother and I owned that, uh, a property not far from the coast. And uh, one morning, I was walking on the beach. And this is a, a labyrinth made of seaweed. And I, fortunately, I had, a I had a camera with me. I took the uh, photo. But when I came back along the you know, to go home to my, get back to my car, the tide had taken the labyrinth away. Yeah, so it was just one of those, those moments. Now, the labyrinth, I'm sure you're all familiar, right, with labyrinths and so on, and, and how the, the, the labyrinth symbolizes transformation from that you, you enter from the, the front and you, you follow and then takes you out to the outer edge and then to the inner. And then when you are in the center, you know, that's sort of like graduation or something, or you finish, you know, you complete whatever uh, inner or outer goal that you have been walking towards. And then you make your way back into the world and uh, give yourself in service to the world. That's how I understand the labyrinth, anyway. And that this is uh, a way of looking at transformation that I think is very endemic, certainly, to the culture of ITP Sophia, and, um, and um, uh, there are many, many other images of transformation, of course, but these just happen to me among my favorites. Any questions or comments? Do you have, is there a labyrinth here on uh, these grounds? I don't remember. Yeah. I know there's been one in front of, the, of ITP Sophia. Yeah, there's a labyrinth there, yeah, yeah. And up in Grace, I was just at Grace Cathedral for the Easter holidays. There's a labyrinth inside and out. Um, so there are many labyrinths now that have been, it's almost a movement of, of, of putting labyrinths, creating labyrinths in backyards and so on and so forth. Okay. <coughs> what happens? Um, with in 1992 and like through 1995 or so, is that when William and I arrived here, we had been trained as experimental psychologists. How many of you know what experimental psychology? You know that. What does that mean? Not the experimental. That's quantitative statistical data analysis. It's as far uh, to the right or conservative. Uh, a research approach that one could take. In other words, uh, do you know the word Skinnerian? Do you know what Skinnerian means? B.F. Skinner? Well, I was actually trained as a Skinnerian, which means I was so far to the uh, conservative uh, right, right from, the, from the research spectrum point of view that, um, you know, that just who I was. I mean, that's what I was trained to do. I was an experimental social psychologist. William Broad um, was also trained in the Midwest um, uh, and at the University of Iowa. And uh, both of our schools were among what, uh, I, I was mentioning this to Jackie and uh, Mike yesterday because we did a little interview. Um, what, what happened? is that in the Midwest, for some reason, the schools in the middle part of the United States, what are called um, uh, the land, large land-grant universities, like the University of Iowa, the University of Nebraska, they were called by or dubbed by uh, Gordon Alpert, a very famous social psychologist, as uh, representative of Dust Bowl empiricism. <laughs> Dust Bowl empiricism. In other words, so kind of dry <laughs> and very technical and very mathematical and very what, what is often known as learning theory. So these were the skills that William and I brought to ITP. Uh, I'm going to say ITP over because it's historically correct. Uh, in 1992. 
And uh, we do some qualitative research methods because qualitative research method, despite all the literature around qualitative research these days, thinking like it's oh, it's like the only new, th it's the new thing on the block. Actually, m part of my dissertation involved a projective technique. Uh, do you know what the ink block, uh, uh, Rorschach ink block? Well, I actually used a technique related to the ink block Rorschach in my dissertation. But it was a very small part of what we were able to do in that, in that era. So we brought these research techniques to our um, uh, dissertation students, assuming we would use these methods uh, to study spiritual topics, transpersonal topics. But our students were very unhappy. <laughs> they really didn't want to include, to entirely use quantitative approaches to research. They wanted from us a way to bridge what they were experiencing spiritually in terms of their personal change and bring that into their research methods. So over and again, as we worked with our students, and, and doctoral students mostly, in designing their research project, what we found is that their, their desire was to involve their personal life in the research project itself. And we had very little to offer them from our stash of expertise for 20 some years that we had been done, doing research. So William and I had to really scramble. We worked hard. We learned phenomenology. We learned uh, on our own. We learned grounded theory on our own. We learned heuristic research methods. And I'll describe these a little bit to you, and, uh, and other <coughs> research methods, narrative research methods. And then we started teaching them to, the, to our students. And bec with the involvement of using story and art and imagery and symbolism together with these traditional uh, methods, we were able to gradually put together uh, what we eventually call transpersonal research approaches or methods. And those methods were articulated first in the first book uh, the two of us wrote uh, in 1998, published in 1998, um, called uh, Transpersonal Research Methods for the Social Sciences. There it is, Honoring Human Experience. And in that, we put forward a rationale for involving one's personal and um, insights and intuition, which always previously had to be hidden in, in presentation of results, to actively involve those in the actual conduct of research, to bring research um, that allowed you to be transformed in the process of being a researcher and conducting research. So when you were interviewing someone, you were also listening to yourself and writing down notes, sometimes, you know, surreptitiously <laughs> or afterwards, about what you experienced while you were listening to that interviewee. Or after the uh, interview, often what some of my students did, I think you did this too, Jackie, is after an interview with someone, they would dance, literally. Sometimes, sometimes you know, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, interviewee was hardly out the door, <laughs> you know. And, they, and the dance itself was a response to the interview. And sometimes they, uh, some of the uh, students or researchers would video their own dance. Is that making sense to you? Mm -hmm. And then as they were dancing, as they were responding to that human being um, th who, with whom they had just spent the last hour or two, as they were responding to that person, they would note their feelings, their experiences, how they were understand whatever intuitions came to arise, and then write them down or draw them as quickly as possible. 
because these things fly away really quickly. You gotta get them down right away. Uh, so it's really important uh, even if you don't decide to dance after you, you, you interview people, and you don't have, there's other ways of getting data rather than interviewing. Uh, if you don't want to dance, you know, it, you can look inside your own uh, body to see how your body is feeling in, at an interior level. Are you afraid? You know, was there fear? Did you pick up fear or res you know, resonate with the fear of the other person or their joy or whatever it is? It could be a, a hundred things, a thousand things. So the, in this way, research methods were wildly, in a way, expanded from what I had been traditionally <coughs> taught. Because in the tradition I was taught, um, radical behaviorism, B.F. Skinner, uh, the only data that was allowable was what you and you, both of you, could see and agree that you saw. That was it. Therefore, any internal data, yours, yours, or mine, was unacceptable as data. Do you see how radically different, how a different change in perspective that is? So, um, these, uh, you know, and I'm not saying that William and I were the only ones that had come to some of these conclusions. That's just not true. There was a whole development of methods and phenomenology and grounded theory, and I'll talk a little bit about them later, uh, that started in the late 60s and developed especially in the 80s, and then in the 90s, qualitative methods just took off. So, uh, but these are the things that we developed with our students. There's no question that William and I could not have done what we did without our students' protests and enthusiasm. <laughs> uh, literally, it was very much a collaborative um, engagement. Uh, it wasn't so much that we interacted with other ITP faculty because most of them were not researchers in the way William and I were. It was our students. So I honor you and honor your being a part of that, uh, of that lineage. And you will teach uh, me and no doubt others uh, a lot of things. Because we have to stay abreast with the times in which we live. It must, it must be that way. So what is your perceptual and intuitive style? How do you uh, deeply know the world and how are you wrong sometimes? I mean, intuition isn't, you know, you can have a strong intuition and be wrong. <laughs> or the things change in the world and then, you know, you're wrong because the world changed. Uh, but one way, I'll just start, I'll just go down the list. Well, no, maybe I, I'm, I never do anything in order. Um, kinesthesia means movement. It's kinetic, kinesis, movement. Authentic movement is a way of moving from the inside. You focus on your inner um, awareness proprioceptively in your organs and your muscles and your tendons and your stomach in particular. And, and then you focus on that and start moving uh, or gesturing. Um, and I do this, I do authentic movement all the time, particularly when I'm stuck. You know, I don't know what to do. And so instead of thinking about what to do, I, I sort of focus on the problem and start um, just moving. And if I do that, what does that mean? What would that mean to you? But don't go there, Rosemary. You know? Or if I do something like this. So I just think about it. And I will do this sometimes in faculty meetings. I, I tell this story so I'm in faculty meetings. And I don't know what's going on. I, I don't know. So I'll go off to, I'll sneak out to the ladies' room. And I'll start doing authentic movement in the stall. <laughs> and I'm quite serious about this. I do this routinely. And um, if I'm basically confused or don't know how to move forward or don't understand a relationship or interaction. It's very, very helpful. So this is one of the things I'm good at. It, it doesn't mean that everybody is, um, but it is something you could develop with experience and practice. Or if I don't know, um, you know, if I'm stuck writing a manuscript, the best thing for me to do is go for a walk. 
or take a bath. <laughs> One of those two. <laughs> taking a bath is, is almost, but that, what taking a bath does, um, moves me down into unconscious and symbolic processes. Okay, so if I'm, if I'm, if I relax, so it's like dreaming. Um, if uh, another way to access, of course, symbolic uh, processes is dreaming uh, or daydreaming and allowing the uh, promptings that come out of that to resolve whatever you're working on. So that's pretty straightforward. And a lot of people at, at ITP, uh, Sophia, our uh, students here, are unusually good at that and attracted often to Jungian work. It's very, very common, or mandala work or something like that, or, or making art to uh, allow their symbolic processes to develop visually on a page. So those are all excellent techniques, not only for your own personal development for research, and that's the point. <laughs> we shouldn't separate our personal development from our research practice and skills. And that became pretty much the subject of Williams in my second book. <coughs> so symbolic processes. Um, direct knowing, silence, sunyata means emptiness in Sanskrit. Uh, it's, it's the direct experience of, of awareness. <laughs> now, of course, I can't give you an example of that, <laughs> you know, an example of emptiness of sunyata. But the, if you've had experiences like that, where you just know something, and it has no sensory modalities like hearing, sm smelling, sou sound, anything like that. It's closer to direct knowing. It is just simply an awareness of something that has no exp rational explanation. Okay. And visceral or gut sense, empathic sense, I think this is a very underused one, but this is, uh, I, I separate it out mostly to emphasize it because it could be in, uh, put up here in, under proprioception, which has to do with the inner organs and muscles and feelings in your inner organs. But haven't you ever had a gut sense about somebody? Good or bad? You know, it could be all over the place. You just had a gut sense. And then, um, and you know, you know, I think people fall in love, <laughs> maybe too often that way, I don't really know. <laughs> but you know, it's just a gut sense about a human being. Sometimes I've known, I met first, for instance, when I met William Broad, I knew we'd be friends for life. I just knew it. And the, fir and the first five senses, so intuition can be related to seeing. You might actually see, uh, an image which would blend with often symbolic processes. You might see an image which informs you about your personal life or relationships or re your research. You know, they're not different. These skills can be used <laughs> both in life and in research. And hearing, this is one that happens to me rarely, but it does happen to me. I actually hear uh, a, a message, auditory message. Um, that has, is not happening in the external world. It's happening in my inner world, okay? Uh, sometimes like when I go into, I remember one succinctly when I was a teenager and I was uh, in, in New York City. I, li I grew up outside in suburban New York City and I was in Manhattan going into a, uh, a metro, a subway, excuse me, subway, uh, a subway station and I was walking down and said, don't go, don't go. So. I'm obedient enough, I figured, well, what have I got to lose? I turned around and I went to another subway station, got there another way. And, then, and I always listen to that stuff. I travel alone very much uh, internationally. I, I like it better because, frankly, if I'm with somebody else, I end up talking to them most of the time. It doesn't make sense. Why should I travel internationally with somebody else? Uh, you know, when I'm traveling internationally by myself, I end up talking to everybody. So it's just, so it's, uh, it's just my preference, uh, you know, you may have other preferences. Uh, honeymoon is an exception, you know, things like that. <laughs> but you know, but you know, it's just, a, it's just a, uh, that um, 
if I feel fearful in an environment, I find my way out of there. You know, there's a gut sense, whether tearing or visceral, however it happens to. And I'm particularly good at restaurants. You know, I can pick out restaurants this way. But that's because my mother was very good at it. She would, we, we'd walk into a restaurant, uh, the family would walk into a restaurant, my mother would be like two feet in, and she'd turn around and go out back out. <laughs> she was impossible in a certain way. <laughs> and, you know, I've never, until I met Martin Luther King, I didn't know anybody more radical than my mother. It, you know, it's true. And she was just so clear about so many things. And it was mostly a visceral gut response. So everybody had to follow mom out back out of the street. Okay. Uh, so it can also occur through smell, smells that occur to you when you're doing data analysis, lavender or something. What does lavender mean to you? And then you start recognizing, you know, looking for connections or taste or touch. The, the, t yeah, that's often underused. It, the, the tactility, in a sense, touch is the fundamental sense because even when you're hearing, it's actually the sound vibrating the, uh, the little hairs inside your ear that then through touch go eventually to your brain and then you interpret them. Do you see what I'm trying to say? So actually touch, and this is a very Buddhist notion that touch is the fundamental sense because all senses are fundamentally tac tactile in that way. And then the one uh, that I think is uh, unusual, at least for my work, because you can find some of this elsewhere, through, through our wounds. That are, and this is often the case with so many dissertation topics at ITP Sophia, is that it is your personal wounds, those things that have, you've had to really resolve and heal in your personal life that bring you your research topic, I mean, it's like in your face kind of topic, okay? Because this is where you have some unusual insight that might be different than the person, say, sitting next to you. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because all of us have wounds. This is not a, any news to anybody. So it's just that those wounds allow you almost a doorway that gives you access to information and perceptions uh, when you're like interviewing or reading material that you can almost read into the uh, text that you're reading or studying or analyzing uh, by interacting with your own experience, not as defining, but as an opening, a place to begin. And it's always important to remember that our, our, our own impressions of data or whatever we're looking, is a place to begin. It's not the place to end. You have to transcend your own understanding eventually. Your own particular experience of whatever it is, whatever wounded you, needs to move to another level as you engage with in more and more data. Because your experience is not everybody's experience. And that's just obvious, but it needs to be said right up front. The, the, the meaning of interpretation, data interpretation, of finding, or what the, the fancy word is hermeneutics. Hermeneutics comes from the word Hermes, which is the god of communication, uh, who communicated from you know, the gods to the human beings and then back. And so hermeneutics has been the, the philosophic term for interpretation. So through your wounds is another source of insight, uh, which is extremely valuable for people in transpersonal psychology.